Thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this wonderful seminar, which I very much enjoyed going to. So this talk will be about the alternative and hypothesis and point processes. And this first slide is that this talk will be reporting on, on work in two joint papers with Brad Rogers, Higher Correlations on the Alternative Hypothesis in 2020, and Limited Mimicry of Point Processes by Point Processes Support on a Lattice, 2021. Results in the first paper uh, were obtained independently by Terry, Terry Tao and his blog post. I'll, I'll say a little about that, a little bit about that later on. Um, the topics I would like to cover are uh, history of the GUE hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And then I will discuss um, point processes, models. And then the third part of the talk, um, the, we'll discuss a point process that uh, behaves like the alternative hypothesis and um, can't, can't be discriminated from the GUE hypothesis on the known data. Um, and then the, um, there's a trade-off on, on how much on band-limited functions, which I will uh, describe briefly at the end of the talk. I, I prepared slides for more, but when I tried to do them, uh, I ran out of time. So the GUE hypothesis, the Gaussian unitary ensemble concerns the distribution of normalized zeta zeros up to high T as T goes to infinity. And the alternative hypothesis concerns an alternative distribution of normalized zeta zeros up to high T, uh, which we've been unable to rule out, and it's believed to be false, I mean, totally false, and, and, and the number theory goal is to uh, rule it out. Um, and uh, this hypothesis is related to the possible existence of exceptional zeros uh, for Dirichlet L functions with real quadratic characters, uh, which, which show up in um, estimating class numbers for quadratic fields. And the goal um, since Siegel's paper in 1935 is to um, show there aren't any exceptional zeros. Um, so this talk will be concerned, uh, the number theory is concerned with the, the, the spacings of the zeta zeros. Um, and there, and the number of zeros of zeta of s um, in the in the critical strip from um, real part of between zero and one, uh, an imaginary part between zero and t, has a well known formula in Titchmarsh: t t over two pi log t over two pi minus t over two pi plus a small error log t. But we are only concerned here with the main term there, which is the one over two pi t log t plus o of t. So it says the average spacing of a zeta zero up to high t is two pi over at around high t is two pi over log t. Um, so there are two ways to handle normalized spacings. So if you just, in the bottom, if you just take the ensemble of all the zeros up, to, up below t, you can rescale them all. We can rescale all the zeros uh, one at a time. Um, you can rescale the spacings by um, multiplying by log t over two pi uniformly on that ensemble of zeros. Or else you can um, re rescale them separately one at a time, um, gamma j tilde, where you uh, re Instead of t, you use the current value log gamma j two pi, and then you do it once and for all. Um, and then the with that definition, the normalized spacing will be gamma j plus one minus gamma j, which achieves average spacing one. Um, why one is interested in um, well, let's say if you take uh, random Dirichlet series, if you even go a little bit to the right of a half and you look at the spacings of where the real parts are equal to zero, are where the 
where the uh, thing is zero, it's oscillating, you'll, you'll get a density that's the same density, but the, the zeros will be spaced completely evenly like a clock. And there, they won't show any fluctuations. Um, but on the a critical line, they apparently they do, and um, at least on Riemann hypothesis. So Conry and Ivanovich, if uh, if you can find a large fraction of zeta zeros having spacing a little bit less than a half the average spacing, then you can um, effectivize Siegel's theorem, and you can prove that for a sufficiently large t, there's a real Dirichlet character. Um, uh, for every real Dirichlet character, L one chi is bounded by log q to the minus to some explicit constant, and that implies by the Dirichlet class number formula that the class number of a quad, real of an imaginary quadratic field will be bigger than the square root of q divided by a fixed power of log q, which then would allow you, uh, well, to for example to um, Prove the prove the effective finiteness of the um, uh, one class per genus quadratic forms the idoneal numbers an, an open problem a long standing open problem due to Euler I okay um, so I remind you on the on the history of what's known about the normalized spacing of zeros and so the breakthrough result of Montgomery showing in 1973 um, shows that indeed there are fluctuations and he proved uh, a po positive proportion of the zeros have uh, spacings less than 0 0.68 of the average spacing. Um, the method's been, that method has been refined and the Record is Carnaro, Chandy, Littman, and Milinovich, who showed an, uh, on RH, got a, the number down to 0 0.60. And there's an averaging method due to Montgomery and Odalisco that puts in weight functions. So you don't necessarily, and um, allows you to show um, zero, small, infinitely many zeros with smaller spacings. And um, they, they originally, but without uh, getting positive proportion, and they got down to 0. 0.5179, and the record is 0. 0.5154 in the Riemann hypothesis, and a preprint put up earlier this year um, analyzes the thing and says that the Montgomery Autolisco method cannot, in principle, get below a smidgen above 0. 0.5. So we don't we don't get below a half. The GUE hypothesis. Um, so this is it's evolved through many forms. This is a uh, the form most convenient here. You you take the the sinc function sine pi x over pi x, which uh, is a nice smooth function, and it interpolates to be one at x equals zero. It has an improper integral that's equal to one, um, and the hypothesis is. Um, if you take n, any test function that's a Schwartz function on, on n-dimensional space and you average it from t to 2t, sampling against all the ordinates of the zeros, um, distinct ordinates of the zeros in the range from t to 2t, then the limit as t goes to infinity will converge to an integral of the test function against the sine kernel determinant which is the determinant of this n by n matrix, uh, which will be, as it says, the endpoint correlation function of a, well, for what we will do here, a point process, um, which is the sine kernel process. Okay, I remind you of one of the many famous plots of Odalisco, um, which is the, normalized consecutive zero spacings, histogram of them. Um, maybe this is the one for 10 to the 20th. The, the curve plotting through the points is the GUE prediction giving great agreement and a positive proportion of the 
normalized spacings are below 0 0.5, so that that would, um, according to the Conry and Vonjek's theorem, would give an effective version uh, if we if we could prove it. So that's what the data says. And the known results, um, Montgomery in 1973, pair correlation, a large calculation of Hedgehog doing the triple correlation. And then um, the seminal work of Rudnick and Sarnak um, doing endpoint correlations. Um, there's, there's a misprint here. It's for fixed N and band limited test functions, eta on S of RN, whose Fourier tran well, the Fourier transform of the test function is required to be in a bounded domain given there. Um, the fact that the Fourier coefficient of the Fourier transform is in a bounded domain makes the is equivalent to the function being band limited. Um, that's the, kind of the definition. And then we get the conversion I said earlier. You in, you take a integrated test function, and as t goes to infinity, it will it will converge to the correct limit of the sine kernel. So, so of the GUE distribution. So what this means is we don't see the GUE distribution directly. We, we see it when we probe it with a test function and we have a limited class of test functions for with which we can probe it this way. And the GUE is verified against these test functions. The alternative hypothesis, um, so let's take those uh, normalized zeta zeros and the alternative hypothesis says you get a very different distribution for all sufficiently large J. The differences, the consecutive differences look like they are half of an integer with, a, with an error going to zero as you go to infinity. This is a very strong form of it. And so if the almost, and this is almost all of the pairs are doing this. So then if you if you take things that are far away, they they still likely will have a half integer difference. So it's saying that the differences are mostly half integers. Um, th this is a straw man. It's discussed in Conry's uh, Riemann hypothesis survey in the notices of the AMS in 2004. I'm not sure if that's the first place it appeared in print. There's a there are very in the in the last ten years there have been a number of variations staring, um, studying the consequences of this hypothesis in detail. Um, we will assume R H. We allow the value zero, which allows multiple zeros, um, but uh, we would would we would expect simple zeros. Um, I'd like to mention some conventions on the Fourier transforms that are in this talk. Um, so the Fourier transform in this talk will be the, the integral against exponential minus two pi i times the product x, x i psi i, and then minus two i pi i for the inverse Fourier transform. The important thing is with this definition, the sinc function as I gave it is the Fourier transform and the characteristic function of the interval minus a half to a half. It's a band limited function with band frequencies in the band minus a half to a half. The uh, signal analysis people use the usual Fourier transform without the two pi i. And then um, the, the definitions of band limited and how wide the bands are um, might differ from this by a factor of two pi i, um, uh, two pi, sorry. Um, more statistics, the um, GUE two-point correlation function, um, if you allow uh, the coincidences, the diagonal, that it will be the temper distribution, the delta function at zero plus one minus sine pi x over pi x squared. The uh, form factor uh, introduced by the physicists um, is essentially the Fourier transform of this. Um, and um, the transform of sine pi x over pi x squared is a conv convolution of the box car with itself. So it's a triangular function supported on minus one to one. Okay, that's so I can put up the one plot where you can tell the GUE apart from the alternative hypothesis um, for two-point correlation functions. It has a triangular gap near zero. 
It has a spike at the origin, which is the delta function, and it has um, um, its flat outside one. And the form factor for the alternative function is the same between minus one to one, which is where you can apply those test functions. And then it repeats periodically with period two. Um, it's easier to draw that form factor because uh, if you drew the histogram, the histogram for the alternative functions will just have uh, spikes at the half integers. Now I would like to uh, flash to the past and discuss uh, the prehistory of the alternative hypothesis, some of which appears in a talk of Heath Brown given in the uh, AIM and RH conference in 1996, uh, which a few of us here were at. Um, this talk is available on a video recording, which you can find on the web. Um, posted by AIM, and um, Heath Brown never wrote the paper. So uh, what, what we have is the talk. But anyway, what the talk does, looking at it, is it finds something like the alternative hypothesis produced by the exceptional zero. And the, the starting point in that talk is to assume you have a, um, you have an L, L value, it should be L of one chi is less than Q, to, it's misprint Q to the minus one quarter minus delta, this violates the Siegel, the Siegel ineffective lower bound, with, which the, 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 that bound proves there are only finitely many such chi. But we are going to see the consequences of assuming you had such an L value, which would have a zero very close to one. Um, and you want to produce the ideas to study things and eventually go back and get a contradiction. Um, but this, uh, analysis has some uh, true true things in it. Um, you study the zeros of the Dedek and zeta function of the imaginary quadratic field, which is zeta of s, l of s chi. He takes the function f of s, which is a normalized version, putting in the gamma factor. Um, so that has the functional equation f of s is f of one minus s. He wants to approximate it with a function that replaces l of s chi was zeta of 2s and then fixes all the Euler factors up to height q where it differs from L of s chi. So there's a, a difference at the primes dividing the, the conductor q, finite set, and then, then you have to switch the signs of some of the Euler factors where chi of p is plus one for p less than q. Um, so h of s plus h of one minus s is supposed to approximate f of s. You've symmetrized it with the functional equation. Um, there's, there's a factor of a half somewhere. Um, not, not sure about that. But anyway, um, the Siegel zero would imply most small primes have chi of p equals minus one. So this last product will uh, push things, um, should be small at zero. The first theorem he announces that if you had such a thing, then the mean value of f of s minus h of s plus h of one minus s will be very small with this factor q to, q to the minus delta will give you, um, and he said it applied for q to the a naught for some large a naught from t up to a very large value. But we're gonna be interested in what happens where it's at this bottom m near q of a naught. Um, and he also stated that the, that the H of S plus H of one minus S satisfies the Riemann hypothesis. Um, um, and then he can prove it. We, we really needed to prove it for a range of heights um, in, this, in this range of heights where he's going to do things. Um, anyway, that, 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 that result is, is interesting and I'd, I'd like to see more on it. Um, the second result he announces is that if um, we're now looking at n of t, which is the counting the zeros of zeta of s times l of s chi. So it's going to grow like one over pi t log t. And he says the, the G function has the Riemann hypothesis. So it's got its zeros one, one half plus i t n and presumably his proof will show they are simple zeros. Um, and then for each zero of this, he's going to find a unique simple zero of zeta of s, l of s chi very close to it. Okay, and so he's getting the full set of zeros uh, 
because NFT, because the sum of the zeros will grow like one over pi log keys. So almost all the zeros. And then his assertion is, if you're down at the bottom end of the range, you get TM minus TN, all of all the all the differences will differ by a half an inch or plus a, plus a small error, um, which would be what this uh, alternate hypothesis asserts. Um, in this equation, I've divided his equation by two pi, which is the density of the zeros of either zeta or L S chi. So you can see the half integer on the right. Um, and he also states at the end of the talk, something like the Fourier transform and the paracorrelation is close to that of this alternate hypothesis form factor, namely that it exists, it exhibits the period two periodicity outside for some finite range of, of one, which increases up to two. So the ingredients of the alternate hypothesis are already in this talk. Now, now what, has happened, what has happened since, of course, is he, he assumed a very strong hypothesis, which we know is, was wrong. But if you replace end of the one quarter with a much weaker hypothesis that says that the C equals zero is at a distance log log Q to a power, which, which we have not ruled out, then some weaker version of the same stuff will be true, um, would, would follow. And, and so you would still see something like the alternative hypothesis. Okay, on to point processes. Well, I mean, the... The GUE and the CUE, they've been studied um, in great detail with, with the finite um, matrix models. And um, in this talk, we'll look at the GUE limit from the viewpoint of infinite finite processes rather than finite random matrix theory. Um, so the random matrix eigenvalue statistics involve taking a limit where the size of the matrices go to infinity. But in this point process viewpoint, we are going directly to n equals plus infinity. Um, and we, we will look at infinite point processes on, on the line with average spacing one. Um, and informally, um, the, there's all this machinery to define point processes, I mean. Um, but informally, we're throwing down a random set, possibly infinite, of, of, of points onto a space X. So the actual measure space is a configuration space of the allowed set of configurations, got a topology, and Borel sets, and, and measure on it. Here, I'm going to consider only the real line as a space or, or a lattice, uh, well, a space of lattice points on the real line. Um, and then we are throwing down points onto these regions. The points may have finite multiplicity. And then when you sample, you get a sample uh, thing, which will be a set of points. A process will be simple if all of its configurations, uh, the, you never always have multiplicity one. These are sometimes called fermionic point processes. And then the information describing a point process for, for a measure, it would be the moments, so this is analogy, the endpoint correlation functions or intensity measures. Um, the correlation functions then, if it's a continuous density, will be rho of n times dx1 through dxn. They, they, they encode information on the expected weighted counts of endpoint configurations in these spaces when you integrate over some finite region, uh, some compact region, for example. But uh, we are going to, um, evaluate them against test functions. So if the, if the test function is one inside a region and zero outside, um, then that would correspond to getting correlations in that finite region. Um, and the correlation functions will encode the expected values of these test functions um, in, the, in the regions. Um, so you we can either use compactly supported smooth test functions um, and then with some under some circumstances, Schwartz functions. And if you have the discrete function on the lattice, we replace the integral with a sum. Um, you'll notice the sum has a form resembling that which goes into the Poisson summation formula, which is certainly what's used. Um, just as um, under some restrictions, the correlation functions uniquely determine the point process. Uh, that's, let's say that's the standard, st state of affairs, 
But in the moment problem for measures, it's known they're, they're a bad example where measures are not uniquely determined by the moments. Um, if the moments don't grow too fast, this doesn't happen. We will, in, in, in the papers, we impose assumptions which put you in the case where you uniquely determine the point process and all the point process we're gonna discuss will satisfy those um, conditions and therefore the correlation functions determine everything. They uniquely determine the process. And the, the conditions are uniform local moments and some extra bounds, exponential bounds in this uniformity. It is known there exist examples where the correlation functions don't uniquely determine the point process. A really big issue with point processes is if you're given a putative set of correlation measures, there's a lot of necessary conditions they have to satisfy, but does there actually set, does there actually exist a point process satisfying having these correlation functions? Um, and the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Even when all the reasonable conditions satisfy, there can be extra reasons um, that stop it from existing. So the next two slides are just about how one can think about how you could produce a point process from zeta zeros. You can consider the normalized spacings of zeta zeros at a particular height t. Then you have a finite ensemble uh, of, of these normalized spacings. They give you a single, um, a single set of points, but we will now allow random translations of these points. We would shift them all to the origin, and then we allow random translations, say, up to t to the fourth, and then Snip it off at this interval minus t to the four, and then you get a then you get a configuration space of sample point sets on a finite interval. Then you then you can run t j off to infinity. You'll get bigger and bigger intervals, and you can hope that these sample spaces, which are behaving like discrete point processes, can converge in some limiting process to to a translation invariant point process on the whole real line. Or you could ask for limit points of this set of zeros at height gz that go to a limit translation invariant point process. Um, the way this turns into mathematics is you would form empirical correlation functions for the finite ones, and then hope that your empirical correlation functions all, all converge in the limit to the correlation functions of a point process. That would be the kind of mathematics you would do. Um, Anyway, a very strong form of the GUE hypothesis from this viewpoint might assert that all sequences of normalized zeta zeros converge in the, in the limit to the sign process. So this limiting GUE process is called the sign process in the, in the point process literature in the sense that all the correlation measures converge. We're not doing any of that in this talk. Um, however, there is, Things like this have been studied in the literature and Chahibi, Najnudo, and Nikabali, for example, try taking random characteristic polynomials of the CUE distribution, and then they can go to a scaling limit and, and infinity and produce a model of um, ra random functions whose, whose ze zeros then would, would function as a, as a point process. Um, and so they succeed to do this. But they, the issue is, um, so our question could be, could there be such a limit of normalized zeta zeros if there were, for example, infinitely many um, sequel zeros and you sampled at a height tj corresponding to that behavior in the uh, talk of Heath Brown, then maybe you could extract a point process that's the alternative hypothesis in some scaling limit. Okay, well, if you're gonna do that, then you would like to know that there actually exists a point process that could fill the bill. And then you would have to solve the existence problem for point processes. And that's what this talk is about, is to exhibit a specific point process that does have the alternative hypothesis type statistics and which will agree with the rudnick sarnak formulas on all the endpoint correlations that are in the, in the rudnick sarnak theorem so that you will be unable to tell it apart 
from the GUE so, prediction. I have to disturb you, sadly. Yes? Uh, I just said very sadly that you can't distinguish. I'm just lamenting the fact that you can't get rid of it. Okay, it's Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I was about to, I was I was expecting you to say that I made a huge mistake <laughs> when you um okay. Um so um let's go back to the translation of variance. Um um, a, a point process in R will said to be will said to be translation invariant if you if you if you if you translate the process you get exactly the same um, distribution as before you get the identical distribution. Um, in particular, that would force all of the endpoint correlation functions to also be translation invariant, and so then we say it's translation invariant in the correlation sense. Um, in our case, the correlation functions determine everything. So the two notions of translation and variant are equivalent, but uh, not in the other case. Um, and when we took these limits, we looked only at, um, we, we were shifting around to get translating and variant point processes in the limit. So let me just say the Poisson processes are all translation and variant and the sign process that we will come to is translation and variant. Um, the sign process is a determinantal point process. So these are point processes that have level repulsion near the near the origin. A process is determinantal if there exists a, a function K, a kernel function R cross R to C on the whole real line, such that has the property that if you restrict it to a compact regions, then this, this function will be in L2. Um, and such that the correlation functions are given by the determinant um, uh, from I, ij to n of k x i x j, and and if it's going to be translation, then that translation invariant that kernel will have the form um, k x i x j is k of x i minus x j, I believe. Um, let me say that there is a complete characterization of which kernel functions k give you a give you a realizable determinantal process first in machi and then detailed in um, proof in shoshnikov um, so these conditions are um, that on a finite region it's a symmetric operator and um, it's uh, got trace class eigenvalues and all the eigenvalues are between zero and one, um, or it's something like that. Um, it's known that determinantal point processes are uniquely determined by their correlation functions. So in particular, there's only one correlation function for such processes. And if you, if you have a set of correlation functions, you can decide whether or not it could be the, if it's a correlation function of a determinantal process, um, you know it's determinantal for sure. Um, there isn't some non-determinantal process that matches it. Um, okay, so the first existence theorem is there exists a determinantal point process, the sign process, whose um, kernel is this translated sync function. And this process is a simple point process, and it is translation invariant under R. The, there are several places in the literature where you can find proofs. Um, they um, have to have to go by very uh, verifying Machi's conditions. No. Okay, uh, so what we are going to need is a discrete version of the sign process. Um, this is a version of the sign process that sits on the lattice A Z, um, and for. Um, uh, Several papers have discussed this this process or used it, but we couldn't find a proof of existence, so we included one um, checking Machi's theorem in the in, in the paper. Um, 
And the proposition is that for, for each parameter A between zero and one, there exists a uh, process, the A discrete sign processes whose configurations will obey that expected value formula, except on the right-hand side, they give you a discretized form of the um, sign kernel on this lattice AZ, AZ to the N for the endpoint end correlation function. This, this process is a simple pro point process, and it is AZ translation invariant. Okay, but it doesn't exist for A bigger than one. Um, so that's a case where there's some, um, there's, there's some um, constraint to this. Okay, so now I want to discuss the um, construction of an alternative hypothesis point process. Um, so it will start with the uh, discrete A sign process and it will show that its correlation functions integrated against this range of brain band limited test functions agree exactly with those of the sign kernel process. And this will apply only if A is between zero and a half. Okay, so although the process itself is defined all the way up to A equals one, these processes. Um, so that if for any N bigger than one and any Schwartz function in, in this class that's supported on the, the, the box minus one over two A to two A to N. So the box never gets bigger than one um, because A, A is, is less than a half. Then the claim is that the integral of the expected value of this thing so the left-hand side is the discretized thing, but the right-hand side is now the continuous thing integrating that, that function over all of Rn. Uh, so that is the, um, so this is, uh, so this is the key, the key lemma. Uh, okay, so there is a proof of this lemma on this page. And of course, uh, no, no one can follow proofs that are quickly going through, um, but I would like, uh, we, want, we want to verify that for, to prove this equivalence, uh, we want to verify for all test functions uh, with Fourier transform supported in there that the equation star holds that the discretized thing on the left-hand side summed over the lattice exactly equals the continuous thing integrated over R, Rn. And the idea to do it is to use Poisson summation on the left-hand side of the equation, which will turn it into sum over F half of L on the dual lattice. So the, um, so in the, the, the original lattice has side at most a half and the, the dual side will then have side at least two, okay? And the, the key thing in this proof is to check that the sign determinant kernel has all its Fourier transform frequencies in minus one to one to the n. And that, that, that is a detailed calculation. The original thing is on minus a half to a half, but you, you have the n factorial things in there. Um, assume you know that that is true. Then the function a of s det si minus sj will have Fourier transform vanishing outside the closed box minus one, minus one over two A to one plus one over two A of N. And since A is less than a half, that box is inside minus two over two. But since we have Schwartz functions, the, um, the Fourier transform is continuous. So it, it, it must vanish on the boundary of the box as well. So we get the open box minus one, minus one over two A, one plus one over two A to N. Okay, and this has the following feature with that Fourier transform. It says all the Fourier coefficients vanish except the zeroth Fourier coefficient. And the zeroth Fourier coefficient is exactly the integral on the right-hand side. So that's um, the proof. Okay. Now, now we have this discrete A sign process that's perfectly matching the correlation functions, but it but it's supported on that lattice, so it is it doesn't have the translation invariance property. Okay, what it does happen is it's it's invariant under lattice, but it's not invariant under R. So to fix the process, we fix this to make a new point process where we take the point configurations and we shift them by 
a random number drawn uniformly from the fundamental domain of the lattice, which is uh, zero to A, okay? So that won't do anything to the, to the correlation functions we're interested in because they always, they always treat the difference of points in the process and the differences of points in the processes are completely unchanged. So all those correlation uh, things from N equals two on up will not be affected in the, in the sine kernel because it's translation invariant. Okay. So the, the, the previous construction allowed us to do this from A from zero to a half. So we will choose the best point A equals a half and we will call the process you get this way, the alternative hypothesis point process. And now it's, it's correlation functions will be supported on R. Um, they will differ from the one half discrete sign process when you did that, that averaging. And the main result will say that this process when integrated against all the um, band limited test functions and the rednex cernic result and additional ones when N is bigger than or equal to three, um, um, will be satisfied. So this is the statement of the result. Um, you take the one half discrete sign process and you take a random variable drawn from zero to a half independently of this process. Then the new point process you get is simple translation invariant and satisfies the uh, matching condition for all band limited Schwartz functions having support in side of Rn psi plus one psi n equals zero or psi one plus psi n less than or equal to two. Um, and moreover, any pair of points and any realized configuration will be separated by positive half integer distances, a half, one, three halves, and so on. So this thing is a completely um, precise limiting thing and it, and it does exist. Now, um, I'd like to say uh, Terry Tao in 2019 in a blog post, while we, while we were writing this, this stuff up, constructed an alternative hypothesis distribution for the CUE ensemble on fixed finite N. So you have N eigenvalues on the unit circle. So the average spacing is one over N. And he said that you can find a distribution where of matrices where all the matrices have eigenvalues with spacings between their um, eigenvalues, um, integer multiples of one over two n. And that this new distribution would agree in all of its low moments exactly with the moments of the CUE distribution. And with the, the um, moments growing, the allowed set of moments growing um, as n uh, gets large, and he also observed uh, at the end of the post about GUE that there would be an, uh, uh, an alternative construction which essentially matches uh, what we've described above, namely um, discretize it on a lattice and then um, um, in integrate over a fundamental domain of the lattice to smooth out. Um, and I want to say that that finite construction and the very nice is 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 it's it's just a very nice thing uh, because there are now finite uh, versions of this um, and the um, the uh, how you handle the moment statistics is uh, very elegant. Um, another remark I want to make is that actually um, this when you when you look at the higher correlation statistics. Um, um, with this uh, domain, you don't, you, they are not enough to, to uniquely reconstruct the higher order correlation function. So any, anything that, be, that behaves like alternative hypothesis must have the same two point, point correlation function as what was on the previous slide. But for the higher correlation things, the, the whole cube is not covered and there are some regions where we don't know the correlations. So there pot potentially are other alternative hypothesis-like processes that do something different there and could be consistent with the rudnick sarnak test function data. Um, this is a very specific one we constructed where uh, its, its correlation functions are determined completely. Um, 
And for example, for this for this distribution, this alternative hypothesis process, you could actually in, in principle, you compute all you can compute all the uh, all the statistics for the probabilities of configuration. So, for example, if you want to compute the probability that, given a point, what's the gap size to the next point? Then, gap size one half to the next point has probability one half minus two over pi squared, and and you get a specific. Um, calculable distribution. And these are the first few values for the gaps of a half or one or three halves or two between two, two points. Okay, that's the end of the alternative hypothesis part. Now I would like to, there's an underlying trade-off there and that's the probability paper, um, which is, uh, something we would call band-limited mimicry of point processes. Um, so that can, um, we had, we found a point process on R and another point process, which was the sine kernel and another point process, which was the discrete sine kernel supported on a lattice AZ that had the property that their endpoint correlation functions were not distinguishable using band-limited test functions having a restricted band bandwidth. Um, and in this case, we will say that the, 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 the point process um, on the lattice is mimicking the, the point process on R at the bandwidth B. And then you can ask for what are the allowable trade-offs between the parameters A and B for, for a fixed process where you could have this mimicry phenomenon where you the discretized thing matches exactly. Um, and by the way, we don't know whether there could be whether this can be done at all. We we looked at two cases in detail: the Poisson point process of any intensity and the sine process, where you can figure out what's happened, and it and it and it differs in the two cases. And um, okay, so the the most basic point process is the Poisson point process, uh, is specified by its endpoint correlations being constants. Uh, the constants lambda n are the intensity of the process, which are basically the expected number of points you can get in a unit interval. So if you want to compare with GUE, you take lambda equals one, then you'll get an average of one, one point in an interval. And then the distribution of the number of points in an interval is given by a Poisson distribution with mean lambda times the length of the interval. Um, so these, these don't have level repulsion. Um, one say that they they would, I didn't put it on this slide because I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Uh, thing, things are as independent as possible for the Poisson process. Um, okay, well, you can do the same thing. You can make a discrete, discrete Poisson process of uh, intensity lambda, which is a point process. It's the number of points that each, each side are, um, in the independent and identically distributed random variables, which are Poisson random variables with mean alpha lambda. Uh, these processes exist for all A and for all lambda. And they're uniquely determined by their correlation functions for all N and all lambda. Uh, the thing is, they're never, a dis they're never a simple point process. There's always a chance of getting, uh, you know, you're putting balls and boxes when you put down this process and um, they, the boxes are allowed to contain more than one ball. They, this is a, this is like, um, okay. Um, so um, I, I, I thought I would only have time um, I've got many, many slides in these things, but I removed them from the talk. I'm just going to state the result. Um, if you're if if you're if you're if you're given alpha a greater than zero and you're given a bandwidth, then uh, the Poisson process can be mimicked at on a lattice A Z for um, minus B to B for any value of B that's less than one over A. For, for A between zero and infinity. And it cannot be mimicked by AZ whenever B is bigger than one over A for, a, for zero to A to infinity. And the mimicking process is exactly an A discrete Poisson process. 
Um, the paper proves a general theorem, which says if you have any translation invariant process, um, any, any translation invariant process at all, you can never mimic at rate above one over A. And this, the Poisson process saturates that bound. And that, that proves the upper bound in the picture. So the upper bound in the picture, this has A, the, the, the lattice AZ on the, on the X axis, and it has the bandwidth B on the Y axis. And the red region, for those of you who are not colorblind, is the region you can't achieve. And the green region, for those of you who aren't colorblind, is the, um, um, the region to the left. Okay, I, I, I say this because I am colorblind red, green, color blind. Oh. Okay, and now I come to the interesting case of the sign process. So there again, is a, it, as there is for any processes, it's a band-limited mimicry trade-off. And the answer is different. Uh, this, the sign process can be mimicked on a, a Z for bandwidth minus B to B, whatever B is less than or equal to one minus A over A. Um, and A can never go above one in, in this result. Um, and the sign process cannot be mimicked for bandwidth one minus A over when B is big, greater than one minus A over A, and that applies for A between zero and a half. Um, and also it cannot be mimicked when the bandwidth is bigger than one over two A, um, which applies when A is bigger than a half. Um, I say it and I can't understand what I said. So here's, here is the picture of what we know about this process at the moment. There is a red region where we know you cannot mimic it. There's a green region where we know you can mimic it. And then there's a white region where we don't know what happens. Um, and the actual process we used in the construction for the alternative hypothesis is, is right there at the point where everything where we, uh, it's right at the la the triple point in this, in this picture. It's an extremal thing. Um, so what we can observe from what I said here is that the, the, the band limit and tra mimicry trade-off differs between processes. Um, it's not completely resolved for the sign process um, and the alternative hypothesis process that we, presented earlier was constructed using the process at the triple point in that uh, mimicry plot above. And I want to conclude with some open questions about this mimicry phenomenon. Is First of all, is it generic or is it rare? Um, are there processes that you just can't mimic at all when you, when you put them on a lattice, that you just can't agreement? Um, I don't know. Um, and I also don't know whether this this phenomenon is is, uh, is um, common or it's rare. Maybe it only occurs in 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 sort of discrete um, in 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 frameworks where the the process is extremely nice, and there, for example, are the sine sine beta processes where beta varies um, over the random matrix parameter and beta equals two is the usual sign process. Um, we don't know. And so to conclude, the alternative process shows the alternative hypothesis can't be ruled out current using the current results on the band limited test functions. Um, and we still have an open problem of um, determining the exact trade-off for the sign kernel process on when you can or cannot band limit. And I would say one main point is that this AH point process does exist, even, even whatever the status of the alternative hypothesis. And this process may show up in other mathematical situations. 
Certainly the A discrete sign process has showed up in other mathematical situations and therefore it may uh, prove interesting in, in the future, uh, uh, even, even in number theory. Thank you.